And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Ellen, who met with a council of light beings during her near-death experience, and today we're going to talk about it. Ellen, thank you for joining me, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm always happy to talk about my experience. (laughs) Well, that's great. Um, so, um, I'll give you the overview and then you can ask me whatever questions you want to ask. Perfect. So, uh, my NDE was a long time ago when there weren't a lot of books about them. And, um, I think there had been one, one or two were out and, uh, I actually had read them. So (laughs) it was good, good prep. And, um, so it was 1985. And I was, I was driving down the road. I had, uh, if you remember, blockbusters. I had dropped off some videos and I was going, then I was going to the grocery store, you know, just putzing around. You know, as they say, most accidents are within five miles of your home. So <laughs> I was going down a road and there was a green light and there was another car coming the opposite direction. We were the only two on the road. And as we got just into the intersection, this guy starts to turn left in in front of me. And it happened so fast, I barely had time to consciously process what was happening, let alone put my foot on the brake. And uh, uh, the good news was I felt no impact whatsoever, Uh, but it was a head-on collision and I felt no impact. But the next thing I knew, I was about 15 feet above my car, looking down at the top of it. And it took me, it took me a minute. <laughs> to, it's like, what? <laughs> to figure out what was going on. And um, I saw the guy in the other car come over and reach in and, and, and do something. And I thought, isn't that sweet? He's coming <laughs> to look to see if I'm okay. And it's like, no, he turned off my, my lights to make it look like I had caused the accident by driving with that lights. <laughs> Fortunately, when I went to court, that ended up not being a problem, but for me. But but so I lost interest because I thought, shouldn't there be, you know, I realized I'm out of my body. Um, so that means that who I am is not the body, which is still sitting in the car. And it's like, cool, (laughs) I'm out of my body. Shouldn't there be a tunnel of light somewhere? Well, as soon as I thought that, I could could hear it and feel it come whoosh in over, like over my right shoulder. Although I could see in like 360 degrees. Um, And I heard it and I felt it before I saw it because the energy that comes through it is so magnificent and so pure and so beautiful and so peaceful that, um, you know, there's no way that you don't want to go toward it. And, and it's also kind of magnetic. It, it, it draws you. I mean, I don't even know if you could fight it or not, but I mean, I guess you could, but because we have free will, but, but it, it draws you. And so it drew me through the tunnel and I was just basking in this feeling of it. And I realized that this is the feeling of love. And um, I, I came out of the tunnel into this like atmosphere that was bright light. And I felt like I had been like a, um, a drop of water from the ocean that had been thrown up on the sand and had been stuck in the sand by myself um, in an alien environment all my life. And, and when I got to this, this, this place, it was as if the, the, the ocean had come and grabbed me back and pulled me back in. And it was like, this is where I belong. This is, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is, this is who and what I am. It's like, I'm made of this, but at the same time, I'm still separate. I have a separate identity, which 
it's kind of hard to hold those two comments, two ideas in, in your head at the same time. And um, as I was, as I was just basking in it saying, woohoo, I'm here, this is great, I'm staying. Um, I heard this commotion and I looked over and it, there were like a hundred people there. And um, the first the first person I saw was my mother, my adopted mother who had died when I was 12 years old. And she and my grand and her mother were there. And uh, my two paternal adoptive grandparents were there. And um, I mean, it was fantastic to see them, a couple aunts and uncles. And uh, it, it was just wonderful to see them. And they were saying, wow, we've been with you this whole time and you've done a great job. And I was kind of saying, well, I haven't accomplished anything. <laughs> but they said, no, no, you don't understand. Just getting up every day and putting one foot in front of the other on planet Earth is a huge success because it's hard there and we know it and and we're here trying to give you as much help as we can and that felt so good and um now the interesting part was that i was adopted as an as an infant and i had i had tried to find my birth family but all the records were sealed and so I saw this man and I immediately knew who he was. He was my birth father. Now I, you know, in, in, in my human form, I did not know anything about my birth family, but here's this man and his parents who were there and, a, and another man who was a grandfather on my mother's side. And I knew exactly who they were. And they knew my adoptive family. And it was like, we all planned this together. It's like, wow, we were all involved in planning that whole thing. And of course, my question was why? But, <laughs> but, uh, but that was really cool. And, and you know, fast forward uh, 13 years, I found my birth family and I saw pictures of him. And I went, oh, my God, that's the same guy I saw, you know, so that was that was proof to me that what I saw was real. And it wasn't just some like hallucination because of a lack of oxygen or something. Um, but anyway, so I, I, I it felt like I stayed with them for like 100 years or so, just, you know, talking and laughing and and all of that. And and finally, I started feeling uncomfortable in this white environment because you know as humans we're used to three dimensions and we're used to colors and I thought it would be so much easier for me if this were like a landscape or something and as I thought that it was as if this hand came across like this that had paints on its fingers and 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 it like painted this landscape. It was like, whoa. <laughs> it's like, I really like this place. And and so it was this like park. And 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 all of the, all of the animals that I had had, you know, in my entire life, all the cats and dogs, all running around, you know, saying hi, chasing, chasing butterflies and stuff, having a great time. And um, the colors there are so intense. It, it's like nothing on planet or everything here is just so washed out. It's like as if you have like a, um, a sheer white curtain and you're looking at everything through that. That's the difference between what things look like on Earth and what they looked like there. And everything was insanely alive i mean just pulsating with life you know the grass uh the the animals the butterflies the flowers and after a while of just admiring this and soaking it all in and thinking wow i could just stay here forever because this is really nice <laughs> i thought well you know i think i'm supposed to go see somebody else but i don't know who it is and um, 
I noticed this path that kind of went down through some, some woods and I followed the path. And as, as I went, it's like, you know, the trees were all alive and I stopped and talked to all of them. And um, I walked over this little bridge over a little stream, little kind of babbling brook. And um, I came out into this clearing that had um, kind of up a hill, there was this uh, like a gazebo building. And I could see that there were beings uh, in, in this building because it's, it's one of those things with the roof and columns, but no walls. So, so I went over there and um, found myself standing in the middle of this circle of like 12 beings of light who were, you know, 12 to 15 feet high. And, um, and they just observed me. <laughs> they beheld me. And you would, you would think that that would feel intimidating. And, and in one sense it did, be, it, it felt intimidating because I knew that they could, they knew everything, every thought, every word, every deed of omission and commission that, of my entire life. And you know how most of us, it's like we remember all of the stuff that we think we did wrong. And we, we don't think about the nice things that we did. And, and we judge ourselves by how much we have accomplished in this life, like what our job title is. And, you know, whether we have, we got married and had a family. And if we had a family, it's like, did our kids become doctors? You know, that kind of stuff. You know, we judge ourselves that way. And I had done none of that. I mean, I had barely managed to, to you know, keep, have jobs that, that barely paid my bills. And I was kind of living hand to mouth. And, and I didn't feel like I had accomplished anything. And, and it was like, well, you know, I, I felt, a, I felt a little ashamed because I felt like I should have accomplished more and done more. And I didn't want these beings seeing that I hadn't. And um, basically they just kept emanating love at me. And, um, and finally I kind of got my wits together and, and I said, uh, you know, what the, pardon my French, what the hell was that? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> what was the point of that exercise? It's like, that place is crazy. And I am not going back because that place is nasty and people are just mean and you can't accomplish anything. It's like walking, trying to walk through hip deep peanut butter. And, and, you know, I, I, I don't care. I, you know, I, I hated it. I can't imagine there was any purpose. And, you know, unless you can show me because it was just bad. And, and, and I felt like, you know, I had starting from the time I was like, abandoned by my birth mother and given, given away for adoption. And then my, my adopted mother died when I was 12. It's like, I felt like I had abandonment and rejection, you know, every day of my life since. And, you know, what the hell was that about? <laughs> so they showed me, I did not have the, like the classic life review, but they showed me kind of like on the big screen, these, all these past lives. And then they showed me this life. And, and they said, you, you had things you wanted to do in this life later on. And in order to do that, you had to master self love. And self love is a really hard one to master. And, 
you tried for a number of lifetimes and didn't master it. I mean, you, you made progress, but you didn't master it. And this time, basically, you were determined that you were going to master it or die trying. And I just looked at them and I said, it almost killed me. And they said, almost. <laughs> they were very chirpy. <laughs> they, were, they were very, very, very loving. I mean, they felt like the personification of this whole atmosphere. Uh, but they also had a sense of humor. And, um, and I related to that. And, um, and, and they told me, they said, you kept your sense of humor through all of that. And that was like a miracle. And that shows the strength that you have as a being that you kept your sense of humor. And, um, and your sense of humor was a gift to the world. And, and uh, so I looked and, you know, I said, well, you know, so what's the purpose of this whole experiment? And they showed me, you know, the evolution of humanity and where we were going to go and, and what was going on. And I said, and that's all well and good, but um, I'm staying here. <laughs> it's like, I'm standing there. I'm five, four. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm staying here and you can't make me leave. <laughs> and they're like, it's okay. You don't have to go you know, you, you really did actually accomplish the main thing that you decided to accomplish in this life. And you do not have to, to go, you can stay. And I'm like, okay, good. I'm going to stay here forever because this is where I belong. This is, this is great. I, you know, as far as I was concerned, life on planet earth is that's what hell is. <laughs> and, um, as I was starting to like relax into that, I heard the phrase, but let us show you what you can accomplish if you go back. And the next thing I knew, I woke up in the emergency room and I started to swear. <laughs> it's like, where, why am I here? <laughs> and, and I was mad. It's like they told me I didn't have to come back. <laughs> so it, it, in that instant, I knew they did not make me come back. But somehow they told me something that convinced me to come back. I could not remember it. And I was mad. I was mad at myself for changing my mind. It's like there should not have been anything that they could tell you to make you come back here. <laughs> you know how awful it is. And so I, I'm like practically screaming in the ER and the, the nurse comes over and says, it's all right. You know, you're, you're in, you're, you're in the hospital. You, you, you've had a car accident. And I, I'm like, no, why am I here? And you were in a car accident. <laughs> it's like, Never mind. <laughs> so I, you know, they talk about integration, which of course is, is really far more important than the actual NDE. And I'm a very slow learner. Um, and it took me a long, long time to, to integrate everything that happened because my, you know, your whole life is like, somebody turned on the blender without the top and you know your whole life goes up onto the ceiling and you kind of like pick pieces off you know <laughs> and um i basically found that i had to kind of change my whole personality because i grew up at a time when being sarcastic was the way to go and and i realized that that's like one the, the lowest form of humor and it's also often uh a, uh, a hostile act. So I kind of had to change my whole personality and that is not an easy thing to do. And so I was very, very depressed for, I'd say five to seven years. And I would like go to bed, praying to die and wake up disappointed. And, um, 
it, it was difficult to uh, to integrate all of this, but 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 I think slowly but surely over many 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 years, um, uh, you know, I, I went through that process. I guess other people go through it faster than I did, but <laughs> that was me. <laughs> And one of the things they did tell me, I kind of felt like uh, in a way they had uh, the universe had hit me in the head with a car to get my attention because I had studied metaphysics for, for years and and I knew all this stuff. I knew all this stuff. And, you know, because I was insecure, I would kind of use it as a as a. Um, as a weapon against people that I was superior because I had this knowledge. But of course, when I was there, what I realized was that I had the knowledge, but I hadn't integrated it into my life or into my heart. And, you know, they say that's, that's the longest journey is between the head and the heart. And so, so that was the, the integration of all of that. And, and, you know, how do you, how do you become authentic? And after years of turning myself into a pretzel to try to be what other people wanted me to be, I knew that I had to become more authentic and move more, even more into self-love consciously, but I didn't even know who, who I was. So that was another process. So it was, <laughs> it was, other people were out accomplishing things and I was dealing with this stuff you know, for like, a, you know, two decades. So, um, but so here I am, I lived through it and uh, my life is a lot better and a lot happier. And uh, I, I still know it is not easy on planet earth and it takes a lot of resilience and a lot of courage to be here. And, but I also know that we have a lot of help and we have as much help as we want. We just have to ask for it. And um, I, I have learned, I communicate with those, those beings, you know, practically every day. And they help me with my writing and um, I do coaching and they help me with that and with presentations and things. So at least I know I'm not going it alone. So that's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Ellen, thank you for sharing your amazing experience with us. Do you think that this experience was pre-planned before birth, an accident, or you were going off track and these beings created this to kind of get you back and put you back on track? I think it's a combination of two. Um, I do believe that I... Um, I set that up because now, now I understand the things that I wanted to do later in life, things like this. And, and you have to have, you know, some self-love in order to get up and talk about this stuff, especially years ago when nobody had ever heard of NDEs and they'd look at you like you were crazy. But uh, I, I think I, I put that in there as a possible exit point if I didn't, if I just could not go on after, cause I mean, it was difficult. I had a difficult, uh, emotionally difficult, not physically difficult, but emotionally, uh, and mentally difficult, uh, early life. And I think I knew I had taken on a lot. So I created a point that could be an exit point or also a point for, you know, my counsel to say, okay, you know, you're a little off course. <laughs> you know, let's course correct if you're going to go back. So I think it was a little bit of both. And um, as I say, I could have stayed if, if, uh, if they hadn't talked me out of it. But, but I, I, you know, I kind of believe the concept in a way that there kind of aren't any accidents especially with the big stuff. I mean, like the whole realizing that, that my whole adoption thing seemed to have been planned. Um, that is like, oh yeah, I guess I planned that. And, and then I, that I planned to lose a parent when I was young. I found out that that, that birth father that I saw 
had died, had dropped dead of a heart attack when I was uh, 14. So in either family, I would have lost, you know, uh, a parent at a young age. So it seems like, okay, was there like a plan A and a plan B? Because there's always free will, you know? So I, I think, I think I planned it hmm. as a, you know, it's like, if I need this exit, I, I'll, I can take it. When you were having your life review, do you feel like, were you only just watching it or were you also kind of reliving it at the same time? Well, that's how I say, I did not have the standard life review where you feel everything. And it might have been because it was kind of so emotionally uh, difficult. It might have been that we chose for me not to feel that. So it was kind of like watching a movie. I mean, I knew it was I knew it was me. But then I had all these other movies of different lives where I was, you know, in different uh some I was male, some I was female, some I was wealthy, some I was poor, some I was in the middle, uh, you know, all of that. And I and in each each case, I knew who, who I was, uh, but I didn't I didn't feel all of that like the classic. Um, now, I'm an empath. And if I hurt somebody, I usually feel it in the moment. So maybe, maybe I didn't need that. <laughs> You mentioned that the beings were about 12 feet tall. Can you tell us more about what they looked like? Well, at the time, um, I was not into ETs or anything like that at all, at all. It's like I thought people who believed in that were crazy. And so what I remembered was that they were beings of light. I, I didn't... I. I couldn't remember features or anything like that. And then for like five years after afterwards, I had people throwing lions at me. <laughs> it's like everybody I knew was giving me, you know, like there's a, a plaque on the wall that's a lion head. I have, I have uh, candlesticks that are lions. I mean, people, I, I had never bought myself anything lion related. And people started buying me jewelry, statues, belts, pictures, books. And I'm like, what? Why? Why? And um, <laughs> I went into the store one day and um, I was looking for a greeting card. And I saw this, this group of cards that were related to um, astrology signs. And I looked at the one for Leo and it was this, this lion headed being with hands and my knees buckled. <laughs> my knees buckled. I went straight down on the floor, totally involuntary. And I thought, Oh my God, that's who I was seeing. They were lion people. And in that moment, it was as if, you know, like they had been standing there covered with a sheet on their heads. And like, it was like somebody pulled all the sheets off and it was like, holy cow, what do I do with this information? And it was, it was a couple of years. Be, it took me before I completely wrapped my head around the fact that, that these were lion beings, uh, highly evolved beings, and, um, and that I was still talking to them. So, yeah. <laughs> Do you think it's possible that you are also a lion being and you've just had your memory erased while you're here? Yes. Well, actually, another thing that came back to me was that they said that they were more my kin than the relatives I had seen. <laughs> and it's like, OK, don't, don't let me remember that because that's even stranger, you know. <laughs> So, so all of this took a long time for me to wrap my head around and, and then it's sort of like, oh, okay, well, it kind of doesn't matter if, if in essence, I'm a lion person, I'm here and I'm in a human suit. So, I mean, that's the most important part, I guess. What's interesting. But Sorry. I guess I bring, I bring some of the qualities of the lion people to planet earth and apparently there aren't too many of us here right now 
what's interesting to think about is for us humans to think how different a lion being would be. But imagine if you're a lion being and you think, wow, how weird would it be to be human? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it kind of, it's sort of like that gives a whole new, uh, new thought behind the idea that I always felt like I didn't belong here and I didn't fit in. And, and I was always very different. And, and, you know, basically humans felt like aliens to me. <laughs> It's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm buying into this whole idea because it, it like, it helps me make sense of my life in a way. Now you mentioned that you're an empath. Do you think you have any other abilities after your NDE that you didn't have prior? I don't think I have any that I didn't have at all. I think they became enhanced. Oh, speaking of lion people, we're about to have a visitation here. <laughs> If you see a little ear. <laughs> I can see, yeah, just an ear from the side. Okay. Oh, oh, that. So this, is, this is Sasha. And he, he needs to be seen. Uh, <laughs> and um, let's see. Okay, lost my train of thought there. Um, Your enhanced abilities. My enhanced abilities. I was always kind of a little psychic kid. And, and, and I remember I was always being accused of eavesdropping because I would know things that to my parents, I had no way of knowing. And I was always highly offended to be accused of something that I hadn't done. And, you know, it didn't seem like, oh, I have this special gift that nobody else has. It's just, I knew things. And, um, I think I think they became enhanced because I I uh, pulled away some of whatever layers of things I had uh, embraced as a way to dampen it down. Mm -hmm. So over the years, it's become enhanced, you know, and I went through a lot of, you know, um, classes, meditations, practices. You know, and just practicing, it's like a muscle, you know, you need to use it. Um, and um, over the years, really built it up. But but when I look back, I, I had always had like gut feelings and things that I knew to believe in. Can you tell us more about how your personality changed after your experience? Well, the, the biggest part was... Um, was the whole sarcasm thing because you know if you look back at uh comedy shows from like the 50s and 60s and and that, i guess yeah 50s and 60s it's like it was all it was so often comedy at the expense of someone else making fun of someone else being sarcastic and um, so I grew up at that time and, you know, my parents were sarcastic. Everybody around me was sarcastic. And, you know, if you had a, um, if you felt insecure and, and I was, so I was psychic and I had a great vocabulary and, and I realized it's like, I could go for the juggler with just one comment and I had no idea of what I had done because I was busy trying to make myself look smart. And um, Sasha, go lie down, please. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that was, that was very difficult. And the, and the other part that I had to change was I realized you can no longer try to be who other people want you to be. You have to be who you are. And I love the Oscar Wilde quote, be yourself because everyone else is taken because, and that's the truth. We're here, each of us to like play our note in the symphony. And if we have a whole bunch of oboes, it's not going to sound like a symphony. It's going to sound like a bunch of oboes <laughs> and, and you get the richness 
from, from all of the different instruments playing their notes. Sorry about that. <laughs> that doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so, so that was the other, I guess the hardest part because I truly did not know who I was. I didn't know what things I liked because if somebody said, well, you, you know, you want to go do this? I'd say yes, because I wanted to please them. And it kind of didn't matter if I liked it or not. I didn't, you know. And so I had to go through a process of one, training myself away from that, that knee jerk, sarcastic response. And also, uh, a long process of figuring out who, who am I? What is my note? I don't know. You know, I was busy trying to play somebody else's note. And, um, and that was, it was like creating a mosaic. I would get a piece over here and a piece over there and a piece over there. And, and it, and it took a while to figure out, you know, who in the heck am I? What inspires you about your experience? <laughs> I can go back. <laughs> so I guess that means you're not afraid of death. No, no. <laughs> it's like it's like I know that this isn't, you know, this isn't forever. You know, I can go back, although, you know, I apparently can't go back at will. But um uh what inspires me? Just the whole the love you know, to, to, to be reminded of the love that we are, the love that we are all held in. Uh, and it's, and it is unconditional love. I mean, so many of us were brought up with, you know, the fear of God, you know, the punishment of God. It's like, no, no, <laughs> it's love. And, and, and the, the more we can embrace that, the better our lives are. Um, and, and the idea that we, um, we're surrounded with, with beings who wanna help us. And, and, and we don't have to go it alone. We were never meant to go it alone because we have all this help but they're not going to interfere. We have to ask. What's the best way to ask? Help. Just say help. Help me now. <laughs> now, I can't take credit for that. Ianla Van Zant, <laughs> who I knew years ago before she was on Oprah um, in Washington, D.C., it said there's only three prayers you need. And the first one is help. And the second one is help me now. And the third one is thank you. And I, you know, they're right here. All we have to do is say, help me with this. And, and, you know, I mean, I've just developed this practice of no matter what I'm doing, I'm like, okay, help me out here. You know, um, you know, I get in, I get in the car if I, and I ask for help with an assistance with my trip to the grocery store or, or, you know, whatever, because, they want to help. And I, I imagine I was in theater. So they have the green room where, where the actors wait. So I got this mental image. I get my, my, my guides give me these amazing mental images. So I get this mental image of all of these like angels and guides hanging around the green room, smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee, which is what we did when I was in theater in college. And, um, <laughs> They're all just chit-chatting, you know, waiting for me to ask them. And, and, and that's kind of like what it is. So it inspires me to know that I'm not alone, that I, you know, that I can ask. And, and, and it is just that easy. And you, boy, you do not have to be reverent. You do not have to be serious. In fact, you know, I argue with my guides. I yell at them. I... <laughs> Like, I'm like, what? Am I dealing with the with the the second string here? Bring in the professionals. You know, you could have done better than that. You know, it's like it's like you don't remember what it's like to be in a body, so cut it out. You know, I mean, I have a very collegial um, 
and and joking kind of irreverent um, uh, relationship with my guides, and and th and they like that. I think they spend a lot of time like this because. <laughs> because I'm stubborn and and sometimes I don't get the hint or I don't want to get the hint um but uh yeah it 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 isn't like some big thing just ask just ask and sometimes we have to get past our ego and our pride in order to ask because we're humans and we can we can handle this you know it's like yeah, you can, but you know, wouldn't it be easier if you had a lot of help doing it? Do they usually communicate with you by giving you mental images or other ways? Uh, I I get things in in different ways, and and um and it's important for people to know that everybody gets their guidance in in their own way, and so if you're trying to get it the way again the oboe thing, if you're trying to to get it. Like you have a friend who hears voices and you're not hearing voices, you may be getting it some other way. So tune into that. So sometimes I get mental images and I think when that's, you know, when a mental image can completely sum up the situation really easily, I get a mental image. Um, when I'm writing, I will all often like hear phrases in my head or if i'm if i'm coaching someone i will often hear phrases or giving a presentation sometimes i'm giving a presentation i'll say something and in my head i'm going oh that's good i should write that down because <laughs> it's like it didn't come from me um sometimes it's just a gut feeling um it, it comes in different ways. And sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's just a knowing and, and I don't know how I know it, but I know it. And, um, or like sometimes somebody will ask, ask a question and it's like, I, I had gotten all these files downloaded into my head. And when the question's asked, the file opens and all this information comes out. So it, it happens to me in different ways. The odd part is meditation does not work for me at all. And I learned that early on, I had to leave a meditation class because it was ruining my self-esteem. <laughs> and, you know, I get, I get my best uh, downloads and information, like when I'm washing, hand washing pans, or when I'm in the shower, or when I'm in the bathroom, you know, it's, or, or on a walk. It, it's just when, when I'm not busy sending out thoughts and I'm just kind of not actively thinking of anything, um, that's when stuff can come into my head the easiest, I think. Maybe when you're doing activities that are like mundane in a way, yeah. and it's like you're on autopilot and it gives exactly. your, your brain kind of shuts down and then you're open up to these communications. Yeah. Now, sometimes you can get, <laughs> when I was first pra practicing, consciously practicing doing this, honing my, my, my abilities, I would ask questions and I would get answers in the funniest ways. I mean, I remember one time I was sitting at a traffic light and a bus pulled up and it had an ad on the side and whatever that ad was answered my question. I'm like, you guys have got to be kidding me. You know, <laughs> it's like, Sometimes it'll be it'll be a line of dialogue in a TV show or you open a magazine and there's something in there. It's and, and you, you feel the resonance. And and that's just it takes practice to to learn to it's the noticing part. It's like we we all get information all the time, but it's the noticing part that we have to practice. You mentioned being on this side is like looking through a white sheet. And to me, it's kind of like we're looking through a filter and not mm -hmm. seeing everything like it should be. Would you say then that on the other side, it's more real than it is here? Totally much more real. Much more real. The colors, everything. Everything is much more alive. Mm. Um, 
I mean, it's hard to describe a color that nobody's ever seen on planet Earth, but that's, you know, whatever, whatever vibrant blue we have, that's nothing compared to what's over there. You know, it's, um, and, and, and it's so vivid. It's still vivid in my head. I mean, I had this experience in 1985, for heaven's sakes, and it's still like it happened yesterday or maybe last week, but, you know, it's still vivid. So are you, this, are you saying that, not vivid. are you saying that the memory of this experience hasn't faded? That's what I'm saying. It's, it's so, it's so, um, it is, it's so vivid and so alive. You mentioned that you needed to come here to master self-love. Mm -hmm. What did you do to master that? Oh, it's not an easy process. Um, part of it was going through uh, the process of learning who I am. And that was, that was simple process of elimination. I would just try things and decide if I liked it or not. Um, I also started giving myself permission to say no, which was really hard <laughs> for a people pleaser. It's really hard because it's like, they might not like me if I say no. So I practiced saying no. And oddly enough, I started having people calling me a bitch. You become a selfish bitch now. And, and I realized that that meant I wasn't going along with their program. And I got to the point where I would say, thank you, it's working. <laughs> and they'd be like, huh? Because it was working. I was learning to say no and to, to do it was, it was okay to do what I wanted to do. Now, sometimes, you know, you want to put yourself out and it might not be something you really think you'll enjoy, but you want to do it for a friend. That's a different thing. That's a, that's a free choice. But if you're just doing, going along with people so that they'll like you, that's, that's not a choice out of self-love. Um, I was told to treat yourself the way you want other people to treat you or, and the, or the way you would treat a child. And um, a lot of that was also um, dealing with the, you know, the, the thoughts in my head that, that would go over and over where you condemn yourself. It's like, oh, you're so stupid. How could you do that? And, and, and hearing those voices and saying, that's ridiculous. You're not stupid. You're, and if you made a mistake, you're allowed to make a mistake because self-love is, is embracing everything about ourselves. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and, and the bad and the ugly are just our own perceptions. So it's, recognizing that we're human, recognizing that we can't do everything, recognizing that we make mistakes and being okay with that. That's all part of self-love. Um, being able to set boundaries. No is a boundary. No is a perfectly good one word sentence in itself. You don't have to explain. <laughs> no. <laughs> And, and, and then you start recognizing how people have been manipulating you and it's horrifying <laughs> and, and you're not do, letting them do it anymore. Um, so it is a process. It does not happen overnight. But, but as you go through this process of setting boundaries and, 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 and realizing when you're being used and re requiring you know, stepping out of toxic relationships and situations and, and participating in relationships where you get something back rather than only being the one who gives all the time um, and, and, you know, demanding to be treated with respect. These are all, all parts of self-love. And if you're coming from a place of non-self-love, you have to practice all of those things. Do you think that there are a lot of people that don't even realize that they are low on self-love? Oh, I think 98% of the world. I'm, I'm a tenant 
of religions, at least when I was growing up, was that, you know, you're flawed just by being born. You know, and you have to do everything right in order to be saved or something. It's like, you know, we're not flawed. We were, we are divine, powerful beings made by the creator exactly as we are. And, um, but somehow we've been taught that we're not worthy. We're not worthy of love. And we need to get over that. Because, you know, when, when you love yourself, one, you're not trying to convince anybody of anything because you don't care. You don't need people to agree with you. Um, you don't need to hurt anybody to feel better about yourself. Uh, you can choose when you want to give of yourself and when not to. Uh, there, there's so much about having self-love that I think could, uh, could really if more and more people can, can work on that, uh, it, it would change the world for the better because you're not, you're not always in competition with everybody if you have self-love. It's, it, you know, cause it doesn't have to be, it can, it, it, things are better when you collaborate, not when you compete necessarily. Um, but a lot of the things that we're taught in society uh, shove us the other way. And we're looking for other people to give us value, to tell us that we're valuable. And um, I think that that was why I had a lot of abandonment and rejection, because if if you're if you have people, you grow up with people who accept you and say, oh, you're wonderful, wah, 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 your whole life, then you go out into the world and you're looking for that kind of validation. But if you have to find your own self-validation inside, nobody can ever take that away. You talked about coaching. Is that what you're doing now? Is coaching people with their lives or NDEs? Or yeah, what? I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really retired. Uh, and um, so I do the things that I like. Uh, I do an, I write a newsletter about um, basically the great shift we're going through and and why all of this chaos is happening and kind of how to deal with it. And it's called Tunnel Vision because it's based on the vision I have from when I went through the tunnel. And um, so I do writing and um, I am a coach. I offer coaching services. I say intuitive coaching because uh, I don't do readings for people. For me, it is it's a it's a conversation about their lives and what's going on, and um, with a combination of of you know my observation skills, I guess, and the information that I get from my guides, I can often. Um, give people a different perspective on what they're going through. And um, a lot of times people get frustrated because they're trying to make something happen and it's just not the time. And, and it's sort of like, you're trying to make this decision, but the decision is, isn't here to make yet. So, you know, just chill. And, um, and but I mean, that's just one example, but I can all often see patterns of behavior and help them to look at that and maybe change things, or at least understand what that pattern means. And uh, but I get a lot of help from my guides when I'm doing that, and um, and it is a conversation. And uh, and and I have little tools that I can give people to help them and stuff. So I kind of I don't advertise. It's on my website. Um, I don't advertise. I also do reconnective healing, which is, um, it, it's kind of, it's energy work. Reconnective healing uh, brings uh, love, light, and information. And to me, the, that, that frequency feels like the same frequency that I experienced when I, when I was home. And um, so I just sort of leave it to the universe. It's like, if somebody needs to talk to me or somebody needs to come for reconnective healing, then they'll find me. What's the name of your website? Lionmagic.com. There's lions again. 
<laughs> well, yeah, because anything I do, it's not just me. <laughs> I feel like I'm bringing the lion magic to the planet. And that uh, I guess that's what I decided I was, my mission was. So if people want to reach out to you and just ask you questions, are you up for that? Sure. And they can still contact you through your website? They can do that. Or, you know, sometimes that doesn't work. <laughs> so uh, they can they can contact me at lionmagic at msn.com. I actually like to answer questions. Oh, great. So I like to interact with people. So I'm. it's kind of like I'm here to help, you know. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? It really is all about love. And, and I believe that, that most of the problems in the world stem from a lack, a massive lack of self-love. And the more we can really come to be, to love ourselves and be authentic in the world, the happier our lives are. And um, we, we are deeply loved. We have so much help as we go through life. We just have to ask for it. And um, the chaotic times that we're going through now are really kind of, this is what's supposed to happen because the, the old the old stuff that is no longer working needs to kind of break down so that we can build new. And uh, we all knew that this was gonna happen when we signed on to come here. And um, everything's, you know, we might go through some tough times, but everything's exactly the way it's supposed to be. Ellen, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm always happy to do it. And uh, I feel like these are the messages that I'm, you know, one of the reasons I came back <laughs> was, was to integrate all this stuff and to, and to, and to share. And um, cause we're all in this together and, you know, we'll accomplish so much more if we go through life holding hands rather than being at each other's throats. <laughs> well, thank you for enduring being back here with us to give us yeah. those messages. <laughs> it's better now. <laughs> all right. Let me Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.